G.K. Chesterton began his writing career defending religion against atheism and agnosticism of the time. He argued that doubt gets us nowhere, that religion makes us joyful about things that matter while the new philosophies make us sad about things that don't matter. Soon he was defending not just religion in general, but Christianity as opposed to all other religions and irreligions. He argued that the Apostles' Creed was the source of the greatest sanity in the world. Other religions not only do not offer the strength and comfort and meaning of Christianity, they do not offer the fierce joy of Christ. Christianity, he said, even when watered down, is hot enough to boil all modern society to rags. But Chesterton noticed that much of modern society was derived from a liberalized and Protestantized Christianity that had fallen far from its origins. Ultimately, Chesterton returned to those origins. He became a Roman Catholic and ended up defending the Catholic Church against the whole world. He called his conversion the chief event of his life. And yet, when he defended the church, he did not like to talk about his own personal experience because he felt that that made the faith look too small. He claimed it was the universal truth, and therefore he wished to defend it as such, speaking in universals by showing how it was true for everybody, and not just himself. But explaining why the truth is true is a huge task, because it means talking about everything. But that's the way it should be. As Chesterton says, a man is not really convinced of a philosophic theory when he finds that something proves it. He's only really convinced when he finds that everything proves it. Still, it does not make it any easier to explain or defend. The difficulty of explaining why I am a Catholic is that there are 10,000 reasons, all amounting to one reason, that Catholicism is true. I could write 10,000 separate sentences, each beginning with the words, the Catholic Church is the only thing that, as for instance, the Catholic Church is the only thing in which the superior cannot be superior, in the sense of supercilious. <whistles> 10,000 reasons, he says, and he starts with that one. The church is the only thing in which the superior cannot be superior in the sense of supercilious, okay? All right, that's, that's a good one. It's just not the one I would have started with. Uh, what, it, what it means is this. The church is of a higher nature than the world. It is, in fact, better than anything in the world. It's heavenly. It informs every other kind of knowledge. It gives an eternal perspective to every other discipline. It holds the keys. It bestows blessings over everything and everyone, over babies when they're baptized, over men and women when they're married, over the dead when they're buried. Only a superior thing can bestow a blessing, but the church can never act superior. That's what supercilious means, acting superior, acting with arrogance. The church cannot do this. It can never puff itself up and look disdainfully on the rest of the world. On the contrary, the church, like Christ, lays itself down for the rest of the world. The church serves the poor, elevating them like kings. The church seeks the outcasts that have been chased away by everyone else. The church looks after the small things, the weak things. It brings knowledge and education the way light is brought into the darkness. But at the same time, it brings charity and humility and sacrifice to the a world that is hateful and selfish and prideful and supercilious. Though the church is the highest thing in the world, it must act like the lowest. 
And this is what Jesus meant when he said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The greatest among you must be your servant. Let's uh, hear another of the 10,000 reasons. The Catholic Church is the only thing that really prevents a sin from being a secret. Okay, that's a good one too. I might not have picked it as the second one. The church is the only thing that prevents a sin from being a secret. Okay, this is a good one. The church is the only thing in the world that calls sin what it is. Sin. It does not explain away sin or dismiss sin or deny sin. It faces sin. It requires us to admit our sin, to confess our sin. And if we do not confess it, it destroys us. If we keep sin a secret, it keeps on doing its deadly deeds in the dark. If we do not confess our personal sins, we fall farther and farther away from God until we deny Him altogether. When we rationalize our behavior, when we justify our misdeeds, we in effect replace God with ourselves. We've thrown out God's rules and replaced them with our own. But by turning around and facing God again, by confessing our sins and acknowledging our faults, by telling our secrets to our confessor, we enter back into communion with our Creator. And what is true for the individual is true for the whole society. When a whole society denies its sin, when it tries, for instance, to claim that homosexual behavior or the slaughter of unborn babies or the neglect of the poor is perfectly acceptable, then the whole society destroys itself. It sinks into dark, dark, and eventually disappears. Chesterton says that a whole people has a soul just as an individual does. And a whole people can repent just as an individual can. As Catholics, we have to be the conscience of a society that's turned away from God. We have to be that voice that keeps telling the world to turn back and confess its sins. As the prophet Isaiah says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Okay, that's two reasons. We still have several thousand to go. The Catholic Church is the only thing that frees a man from the degrading slavery of being a child of his age. Now, that's more like it. I'm surprised he didn't start with that one. The Catholic Church is the only thing that frees a man from the degrading slavery of being a child of his age. The way of Christ and the way of the world are diametrically opposed. When we follow Christ, we're going against the way of the world. For Chesterton, this is liberating. To be caught up in the way of the world is to be a slave, to fads, to fashions, to trendy ideas that always fall, always fail, always flee. The church is not burdened by fashion, and fashion is a burden. It's a beast that is insatiable and never satisfied. It's always changing. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. To be a child of the age is, as Chesterton says, degrading. But to transcend the age is exhilarating. It's an act of dignity to defy the fads. As Chesterton says, a dead thing can go with the stream, only a living thing can go against it. The Catholic Church is the only thing that talks as if it were the truth as if it were a real messenger, refusing to tamper with a real message. This is very important. The Catholic Church is the only thing that talks as if it were the truth, as if it were a real messenger, refusing to tamper with a real message. One of the many things that the world does not understand about the Church. Now, two of the many things that the world does not understand about the Church is that it speaks its message with authority and that it cannot tamper with its message. It cannot change the truth. It can only try to convey the truth. That's why Pope Paul VI could not issue an encyclical approving contraception. He could only uphold the truth that had been passed along to him by the authority of the Church, authorized by the author of life himself. 
That's why a pope cannot suddenly ordain women as priests. He has no authority to do so. There's a sacred order to things. Priesthood has a specific meaning, and no one in the church can simply change the meaning to his own liking. The pope risks being unpopular with the whole world, including even many Catholics, every time he makes a pronouncement, because people often do not want to hear the truth. But when a pope makes a pronouncement, he does not say anything new. He only tries to make truths clear, truths that are very old. There are no new truths, only the truth that makes all things new. The Catholic Church is the only type of Christianity that really contains every type of man, even the respectable man. A typical Chesterton paradox. The Catholic Church is the only type of Christianity that really contains every type of man, even the respectable man, something the opposite of what we would expect. But think about it. Most religions appeal to the poor and the humble, the, the common man. That's because religion is something natural, natural to normal human beings. Our souls long for God as much as our bodies thirst for water. But there's a minority of people, the sophisticated, the educated, the wealthy, people who, interestingly enough, are respectable in the world who reject religion, who have convinced themselves that religion is something merely for the ignorant and the unwashed. But the Catholic Church has a way of bringing even these proud folks to their knees. The Church satisfies the needs of the intellect. It satisfies the needs of the senses, including the artistic sense. It even satisfies the needs of people who think they have everything. The Catholic Church is the only place in this world where money has no power, where wealth is exactly the opposite of what is important. The church appeals to an amazingly wide variety of people, even to people to whom religion does not normally appeal. It reaches across class, across borders, and even across time. It is as universal as its name suggests. Let's hear another reason. The Catholic Church is the only large attempt to change the world from the inside, working through wills and not laws. The Catholic Church is the only large attempt to change the world from the inside, which means it's trying to change people only by changing their minds. Every other large institution tries to change the world from the outside. They rely on power, on forcing different mechanisms and environments and behaviors on people. There's a difference between power and authority. The church does not act with power, it acts with authority. In fact, about the only times it has really failed in its mission have been when it has tried to use power. And in those cases, the church's weakness was that it gave into the world and tried to use the world's devices. It undermined its own authority by imitating the world's methods of using power. Authority is connected to the author, to the one who authorizes. It was Christ himself who gave authority to his apostles and to Peter, the rock upon whom he built his church. Authority is something we choose to recognize, to honor, and to obey. Power is something that is merely coercive or restrictive, something that leaves us with no choice. For Chesterton, one of the greatest doctrines of the Catholic faith is free will, what he calls the dizzying liberty of the church. It does not force anyone into the truth. We have to make the choice ourselves, and we have to make the choice every day. The Catholic Church is the only institution that ever attempted to create a machinery of pardon. The Church is the only thing that ever attempted by a system to pursue and discover crimes, not in order to avenge, but in order to forgive them. I was waiting for one like this. Chesterton, the lover and writer of detective stories here, likens the church to a detective, a sleuth who pursues and discovers crimes 
not in order to avenge them, but to forgive them. That is exactly what his great character, Father Brown, does so charmingly and so well in story after story. Chesterton says that the church has a merciless mercy. The church is an unrelenting sleuth, tirelessly and doggedly hunting down souls in order to save them instead of slay them. And he says that what gives the adventure even more dramatic tension is that the modern world curses the church for not saving the world which does not wish to be saved. The Catholic Church is the only thing that ever founded a civilization on first love, on the single and romantic view of sex. We have the only scheme that believes in chivalry. We alone serve St. George and St. Valentine. We alone, among the great religions of the world, have a creed that interprets mystically these physical things. We alone believe in the resurrection of the body. We just talked about the church trying to change the world from the inside. But we also have to admit that the, that the church has already changed the world. We've forgotten that our civilization is based on the church's teachings not only its laws, but its everyday life. The high view of marriage and the family, the proper respect of the body, the role of chivalry. These are all based on the sacraments. And our whole society declines as we move away from those basic and beautiful things. The Catholic Church is the only continuous intelligent institution that has been thinking about thinking for 2,000 years. Its experience covers nearly all experiences, and especially nearly all errors. The Church makes itself responsible for warning her people against all the blind alleys and dead ends and roads that lead to destruction. She dogmatically defends humanity from its worst foes, from those devouring monsters of the old mistakes. There is no other corporate mind in the world that is on the watch to prevent minds from going wrong. The policeman comes too late when he tries to prevent men from going wrong. The doctor comes too late for he only comes to lock up a madman, not to advise a sane man on how not to go mad. And all other sects and schools are inadequate for the purpose. This is not because each of them may not contain a truth, but precisely because each of them does contain a truth. And it is content to contain a truth. None of the others really pretend to contain the truth. None of the others, that is, really pretends to be looking out in all directions at once. You see, the church is not merely armed against the heresies of the past or even of the present, but equally against those of the future that may be the exact opposite of those of the present. Uh, I, I can't add anything to that. The Catholic Church is the only philosophy operating from first principles and not from fashionable prejudices. First principles. Now this would have been a good one to start with. First principles, after all, could there be a better place to start? Chesterton is a great defender of the faith and one of the reasons is that he's so reasonable. He knows how to use the tool of reason, but the tool has its limits, especially in today's intellectual confusion where people are unable to grasp the abstract concept of first principles. A first principle means the thing with which thought has to start, since it must start with something. A first principle is a thing which cannot be proved and need not be proved, either because it's self-evident or it's accepted by most everyone. In other words, it's something like common sense. 
Chesterton claims that the Catholic Church is the only philosophy operating from first principles. For instance, we could use first principles to establish the basis of one of the fundamental doctrines of the faith, which is the fall of man. We could start by saying that it's a first principle that men desire happiness. Most everyone agrees with that idea. Without us, we don't have to prove it. In fact, anybody who denies that men desire happiness is, well, cracked. If we grant as a first principle that men desire happiness, we can go on from there to examine the curious manner in which they fail to get happiness. And then by referring to experience and reason, we can show the soundness of the doctrine of the fall. And from there, we can continue to the subsequent ideas of redemption and revelation. And then we could consider the, the record of that revelation and what it's said and in what sense it should be taken. Very systematically, we could make the whole case for the truth of the Catholic faith. The Catholic Church is the only church that can claim to be the church. The most unacceptable and unpalatable claim of the Catholic Church in today's world is the Church's claim to be the true Church. G.K. Chesterton is one of the great ecumenical writers. He's admired by Catholics, Protestants, and even non-Christians because of his goodness and his truthfulness and his unconquerable joy. He's very fair to other faiths. He acknowledges that Many Protestant sects have had their own saints and prophets and provided a living and inspiring faith for their adherents. But each of these sects came about because they believed they were right and everybody else was wrong. In the end, their ultimate claim has to be weighed against the claim of the Catholic Church, the one that they broke away from. It requires far more faith or fanaticism, says Chesterton, to believe that a small chapel can sustain its own claim over the great international Catholic Church. And as a matter of fact, most of the Protestant sects, which arose out of the claim that they were right and everybody else was wrong, gradually retreated into the stance that nobody is completely right and everybody is probably a little wrong. And this led to the position taken by modern philosophy that everybody is equally wrong. The rise of Protestantism led directly to the fall of Protestantism. The Catholic Church is the only practice that is not only right, but right where everything else is wrong. Right where everything else is wrong. This is a grand claim indeed. But the Catholic Church brings us the honesty of the confessional when the rest of the world soothes itself with the lies of psychology. The Church upholds humility when the rest of the world preaches pride. The Church brings sacrificial charity to relieve human suffering when the rest of the world wants brutal utilitarianism. The Church teaches free will and responsibility when the rest of the world trips into determinism and irresponsibility. The church keeps a well-defined doctrine when the rest of the world wants broad and meaningless sentimentalism. The church values the past when the rest of the world wants to forget it. But the church is also realistic about the future, as in the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, hell, when the rest of the world talks only about progress and utopia. And the church embraces life in the midst of a culture of death. Hmm. It looks like we're uh, not going to have time to discuss all 10,000 reasons why a person should be Catholic. But we did pretty well. We got through uh, 12. All good ones, too. And all amounting to the same reason, that Catholicism is true. But before we go, we should add one other reason. After his conversion, Chesterton never missed Sunday Mass or a holy day of obligation. One Sunday morning as he was struggling to get ready to go to Mass, he said that 
Only a religion that was true could get him out of bed that early in the morning. I'm Dale Alquist. Thank you for joining us on the Apostle of Common Sense.